This morning, less than 60 days from the midterms, the race for Lieutenant Governor getting interesting. We become more and more diverse in the state of Texas. Our leadership needs to adapt. State Senator Kel Seliger, the second Republican official now, saying he will vote for Democrat Mike Collier over incumbent Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Does this represent with Kel Seliger and Glenn Whitley, does this represent anything more than just two disgruntled Republicans? What does oh, all this mean to the Collier you know, campaign? The he is in studio oh, with us. Dan Patrick's team telling us that he was unavailable to appear. A new poll, a new snapshot of where the state's biggest races are right now. Rochelle Garza still within the margin of error in her race against incumbent Attorney General Ken Paxton. And Dallas County's jail is approaching capacity. There's a lot of folks that we can blame, but it largely rests on the criminal district judges. County Commissioner J.J. Koch asking why Harris County has reduced its backlog of cases, but Dallas cannot. The commissioner also with a request this morning to state lawmakers. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to our viewers across the state. Labor Day behind us now. Attention is focused on November. With that, let's start with the latest headlines happening across our state here. The race for lieutenant governor has made quite a few headlines in the last few days. Two Republicans have broken from Dan Patrick and say they will back Democrat Mike Collier in that race. But one Democrat, State Senator Eddie Lucio Jr. there in the bow tie, he is now backing Patrick. Lucio called Patrick a hero and a legend. Lucio represents parts of South Texas from Corpus Christi down to Brownsville, but he often votes with the GOP. Another poll shows Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton in a close race for re-election here. Democrat Rochelle Garza is three points behind Paxton in a brand new survey. The University of Houston and Texas Southern University did this survey. It's the third poll with similar results like this. 10% of likely voters polled though say they are still undecided in this race. And some brand new numbers on how much it is costing Texas to bus migrants up to the northern cities. Governor Greg Abbott's program has cost so far about $14 million to Texas taxpayers. The Houston Chronicle, though, did the math a step further here and found out that's about $1,700 that taxpayers in Texas are paying per migrant to drive them to D.C., to New York, and Chicago. For context, $1,700 a bus ride, that's significantly more and a first-class flight is. Let's begin, though, with the story that is disrupting the race for lieutenant governor. A second Republican official now says he, too, will vote for the Democrat in this race, Mike Collier, rather than the Republican incumbent, Dan Patrick. Tarrant County Judge Glenn Whitley was the first to announce that here on Inside Texas Politics last week. This morning, Republican State Senator Kel Seliger says he's going to do the same thing. The political website called The Quorum Report broke the Seliger story, so we called the senator with our own questions at his district office in Amarillo. Senator, we appreciate you taking some time for us here. You did not endorse Dan Patrick in 2018. Now, four years later, you say you're going to vote for Democrat Mike Collier. Tell us how you arrived at this decision. Well, first of all, Dan Patrick didn't endorse me in 2018. And I was also a Republican running for re-election. And uh, I, I'm voting for Mike Collier partly for Texas and partly for the Texas Senate. And the, the more and more, uh, the, the Republican Party has getting, been getting more and more extreme in the state of Texas. And we need somebody in that office who's going to represent all the people of the state of Texas, regardless of their character, their color or personal philosophy or things like that. Um, we need to be far more inclusive, and we need to get back to real conservatism, not just talking about conservatism. When you pay $20 million to buy something called the Texas State Gold Bullion Depository, and the state of Texas has no gold bullion, a measure which Dan Patrick supported, that's not conservative. When you take away, when you're opposed to things like local control, that's not conservative. When you work to undermine public schools by taking money that would go to public schools and give them to private schools, that is not conservative. On the Senate side, uh, the Republican caucus on, on, in the state Senate works under threats of demotion. And if they differ from the lieutenant governor's viewpoints, they are penalized. 
And, and, and vindictiveness is not an element of leadership. You know, Senator, a, a lot of people might look at this and say, listen, you're not running for re-election. It's easy for you to say this stuff now. But, but you were publicly sparring with the lieutenant governor uh, for several years over things. In 2017, the lieutenant governor made big pronouncement that he had 30 priorities, 30 legislative priorities. No other lieutenant governor had really done something like that. I voted against two of them. And for that, I lost my chairmanship and I lost membership on things like the finance committee, which was a real slap in the face to the people in, in West Texas. And um, that's the way the Senate runs. On the right, you you know you're going to hear from fellow uh, conservatives. I'm sure you already have. Who's you know going to question your Republican credentials? Uh, what do you say to them? Are you still politically conservative? I've been a Republican. I've always been a Republican. I've always been a conservative. But that does not have, carry with it the obligation to meet other people's standards of conservative. It is a huge, big government measure to take away from cities the right to regulate the number of chickens that people keep in their backyards, a bill that Dan Patrick supported. That is huge government. That's not up to the state of Texas. It's up to local city councils. And if people don't like it, they get a new city council. By making this public statement saying you're gonna vote for Mike Collier, you're obviously sending a message. What specifically do you want that message to be to Texans? That we need to, is we become more and more diverse in the state of Texas. Our leadership needs to adapt to that diversity and, and, and try to represent all of the people in the state of Texas, even the ones with whom we have philosophical disagreements. And I think that's, that's very important. Dan Patrick is an extremist. And some of the things that he is very, very intent about, I share those feelings. And some of them I don't. And uh, I think we need to get back to, to good, moderate leadership that represents all the people of the state of Texas. Senator, we appreciate you taking some time this morning. Thank you for having me. Let's return now to accountability after Uvalde. It has been slow. Remember, there were more state troopers there at the scene that day than any other law enforcement agency. 91 troopers were there. We now know at least five of them are under investigation for the mass murder of fourth graders in that elementary school, and specifically the law enforcement response to it. Matthew Watkins is the managing editor of news and politics at the Texas Tribune. He is in Austin. Matthew, good to see you. Do, do we have any idea what these troopers are being investigated for and whether any more troopers might be under investigation for the response? So DPS has not said the exact reasons or what they're being investigated for. I mean, we do know some of the questions, right? As you already mentioned, there were more DPS troopers on the scene than anyone else. It took more than an hour for law enforcement to storm the classroom where the shooter was holed up. And the questions persist about, you know, DPS is one of their roles is to kind of help under-resourced departments. The Uvalde PD or the Uvalde ISD police department is a tiny department, not sufficiently equipped to handle a incident like this. So I think one of the questions people are wondering about is why didn't they do more to kind of take control of the situation if, as DPS has said, it was so mismanaged by the, the jurisdiction that was in charge. And, and politically speaking, do you expect any of this to have any reverberations in Governor Abbott's reelection campaign? You know, I would say Abbott continues to take heat on this and continues to kind of act as someone who's concerned about the blowback here. You know, of course, he said early on that things could have been worse if not for the actions of law enforcement. There was a television commercial that started airing today by a group kind of attacking Abbott over this issue. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that uh, will continue to be a topic of conversation in the campaign. All right, Matthew, back to you in just a moment. Thank you very much. Coming up next here, Mike Collier in studio, the Democrat running for lieutenant governor, getting Republican support. What is his strategy with all of that during the last 60 days before the election? And Dallas County's jail approaching capacity. County Commissioner J.J. Koch on why the problem is getting worse and what he wants the state to do next legislative session. And if you want to keep up with Texas politics during the week, subscribe to our podcast. It is called Y'all Ticks, new content, fresh interviews. Episodes drop every Sunday here, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. We invited Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick to join us on the program this morning. His campaign said he was unavailable. So how big of a deal is it that two Texas Republican officials say they're now going to vote for the Democrat running against Patrick? 
Mike Collier's campaign certainly got a boost from these endorsements, at least in the headlines. We spoke to Collier about that in studio. Mike, good morning to you. D does this represent, with Kel Seliger and Glenn Whitley, does this represent anything more than just two disgruntled Republicans? Oh, I think so. I think so. I mean, uh, you know, Jason, I've been running around the state now for quite a long time. And when I travel the state, I talk to Democrats, of course. But I also talk to independents. I also talk to Republicans. I've got a lot of Republicans in my personal life, in my professional life. And I've spoken to those guys many times. No, I think they're concerned about the direction of the state. You know, the lieutenant governor has outsized influence on where we go as a state, and we are not headed in the right place. For example, Glenn Whitley is very concerned about property taxes. He's very concerned about local control. He ought to be. So am I. How many Republican elected officials have agreed to meet with you since you started the campaign? Oh, I suppose about a dozen. Yeah, I suppose about a dozen. And, and what has uh, the reaction been? And, uh, th these guys are in office. It could be dangerous meeting with a Democrat like you. Well, sometimes it's okay to be seen walking into their office. Sometimes we meet someplace else so that really? nobody can see. Yeah, that, just, that happens. You know, but I think, you know, these are elected officials, and they have constituents they're concerned about. They really, I think, partisan politics makes life difficult for them. I mean, they're just trying to make sure that we got good roads, make sure that you got, you know, law enforcement to make sure the budget makes sense. And they, he they hear me come around and we just talk about the numbers and what's it take to have good policy in the state. They, they seem very welcoming to me. A, a dozen Republican elected officials. Does that, that surprise you that they took your meeting, that they said, yeah, no. we'd like to meet with you? No, no, it doesn't at all. Well, like I say, I mean, I've been running around the state for a long time, and I talk to Democrats and Republicans and independents. In my professional life in the energy industry, I talk to Republicans all day long. Right. And it's very refreshing for me, I can tell you, as the candidate, because we roll up our sleeves and we talk about policy and what makes this state work, what do we need to do different. It gives me a great sense of confidence that if I'm honored to be the lieutenant governor, then we can roll up our sleeves and not make everything partisan warfare, but just, and some of these problems that we have to solve are complicated. Fixing the damn grid is not simple stuff. And it's good to have friends and we talk about these things. I've said that many times over many years. Let's take the politics out of it and just talk about policy. It's challenging to do that in today's environment. But when you have folks on the other side of the aisle, and I'm not sure this is, I'm not aware of this ever happening before. I don't think it's happening around the country, but it's happening here. And you have folks on the other side of the aisle saying, I know him, I've met with him, I agree with him on many things. That helps me a lot. Well, what role will Seliger or Whitley play in your campaign, if at all? Will they appear on mailers and ads, write you a check? Do you, do you think they'll have any role at all? Well, I don't expect them to write any checks. I have to do all that work myself. Uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, I think, they, I think they have a strong desire to see me win this race. And they have their networks. And, uh, and I'm not going to make them part of the team. You know, we're not going to have a daily conference call. I'm not going to ask them to do X or Y or Z. But I would say this, they are sufficiently enthused to come out publicly, and I think now they want me to win. And I suspect that they'll help, and I hope they do. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Texas lawmakers will have $27 billion more to spend when they reconvene in January. A Dallas County Commissioner is urging the state and lawmakers there and the next lieutenant governor to share that windfall rather than sock it away in savings. But the more immediate problem, at least in Dallas, is the county jail. It is close to capacity. And we begin there with the county commissioner, J.J. Koch, the only Republican serving on Dallas's county commission. Commissioner, good to see you. Let's start out with, with a basic question. What happens if the county jail exceeds capacity? We spend a lot of money, a lot of money. Uh, basically, we'll have to ship folks uh, to other places. Currently, Harris County is shipping folks to Louisiana, uh, to some of their facilities. And from what I understand, they're spending somewhere near $26 million to do so. So um, we're already spending a, a tremendous amount in overtime dollars. If we go about 900 more folks in our jail, we'll be spending millions of dollars to house them elsewhere. The big question is, how in the world do we get to this situation? Normally, the jail population is around 5,000 or so. The capacity is, I think, what, 7,200? Yes. And now we're up in the 6,800 or 6,000s. Yes. How did we get here? Um, there's a lot of folks that we can blame, but it largely rests on the criminal district judges. Um, they're they, just not approving cases or, or not, not pushing cases through or what? Yeah, they're not disposing of enough cases. And one of the big things is they have to hold trials. And typically, when you get closer to trial, usually plea deals in those more difficult cases where there are certain contentious issues can get resolved. Because we have not been holding trials, no one has had their feet held to the fire uh, in the camp of the prosecutors or the defendants. The, the, the judges say that, that COVID was a big issue. We all know that COVID interrupted a lot of things. 
but we're a year out from from a lot, you know, a, a lot of the, the COVID issues here. Are, are the judges not acting as fast on the criminal side as they are on the civil side or the family yeah, side? That's absolutely the case. I mean, because you look at our peer counties, those other urban counties that had to deal with the same COVID. I mean, COVID was here in Dallas as it was in Tarrant County, as it was in Collin County, and particularly as it was in Harris County. And Harris County probably dealt with the COVID restrictions very similar uh, in, in fashion that, that we did here in Dallas. And they are, you know, they've worked down uh, their backlog very quickly. Um, and we haven't. Legislature reconvenes in January. From a county perspective, what do you want state lawmakers to do? Because we've watched them chip away at local control for session after session. Yeah. Um, I do need them first to no longer hang on to that incredible surplus they have. That's going to be the most important thing. And a lot of those funds need to be funneled into mental health. Um, we bear to, the, to pay for what? To pay for outpatient care and inpatient care. Um, the second largest mental health facility in the state of Texas is the Dallas County Jail. Right, so we receive a lot of those folks. We're paying for mental health services, um, no matter what. We need the state to help us do that before someone gets in jail. More effective outpatient services, more beds for inpatient services, but then also we need more training. We need to make uh, going into the the mental health care field more accessible to more individuals because we just need more people in that field to identify those that have mental illness early in the process, so as to avoid some of the the great tragedies in the individual's lives, but then, of course, the spectacular tragedies that we see on the news far too often. Commissioner, thank you for the time. Thanks. In case you're wondering, the largest mental health facility in the state is the Harris County Jail in Houston. Texas has a million new voters. How much do we really know about them, though? Are they Republican, Democrat? Who are they? A question I will ask next on The round. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Matthew Watkins is back with us from the Texas Tribune in Austin. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And Bernadine Steptoe is a political producer at WFAA in Dallas and joins us for this segment each week. You know, uh, Matthew, let's start with you and talk about this Whitley news, the Seliger news, the Eddie Lucio Jr. news. It, you know, we're still, what, 60 days away from the, the election. Is any of this going to play a role at all the closer we get to Election Day? You know, I'm not sure how huge any of these names are to the average Texas voter, but I think the the narrative here aligns with what Mike Collier is wanting to push. And, you know, the fact is that Dan Patrick engaged with Collier over this, which is something that he hasn't done on any other issue really during the campaign. So it seems to have struck at least somewhat of a nerve. And, you know, but a lot of folks have been talking, at least in these circles, whether any other Republicans might come out and endorse Mike Collier over uh, Dan Patrick. You spoke with a former uh, Fort Worth Mayor Betsy Price, who is a Republican. What did she tell you? Right. Betsy Price says uh, just, and this is a, a first, she's a, been a strong Republican for 20 years, campaigned for, for uh, Abbott, for, for Rick Perry, for the Bushes, uh, even for Donald Trump. But she says, do not vote for the party at all this year. Vote for the best candidate. Uh, that's as far as she'll go. She says, don't vote by party at all. Uh, yeah, I, I think in this case, I think what uh, Glenn Whitley and Kel Seliger has, have done is open the door for someone else to join them if they want to come join them in the boat. Uh, you know, it's also kind of put a dent in the just the aura of inevitability around Dan Patrick's re-election. You know, people are kind of scratching and saying, well, is he going to get re-elected? Maybe not. And Bernadine, if we if we zoom out, taking the news about Betsy Price that Bud broke on Friday and Kel Seliger, Glenn Whitley, how big of a deal is that? And I guess the broader question, do you think that, that Governor Patrick is leaking any support at all? You know what? One thing that I'm sure Lieutenant Governor Patrick doesn't like is the fact that he's having to talk about his opponent. And uh, he's having to deal with the fact that some of his Republicans are turning against him. And nobody wants that, especially this close to the election, which is, you know, in terms of elections and politics, we are far out. But no candidate wants to get off of their message to talk about their opponent. And that is what uh, Patrick is having to do. And, and of course, all the campaigns, Bud, are looking at these new voters in the state. There are a million new voters since the 2020 election. What do we know about them? Well, the new voters, of course, it's tough since they haven't voted yet to have any kind of party record. But judging from all the data that's available on demographics, on, on uh, you know consumer data, you know, we can guess they're about 70% Democratic uh, you know, among the younger voters. 
mostly younger voters, 70% Democratic, but there's no outpouring of women voters like there was in Kansas. Uh, they're evenly uh, evenly split, young men, young women, uh, mostly Democrats. And, and now the, the new voters are about 55, 45 Democrats. And no outpouring, Bernadine, of, of women. What, what does that tell you? Well, no outpouring of women of new voters right. or new or registered voters, because keep in mind there there could be a large number who've already registered. But one thing about it is that those new voters now, the, the challenge that the Democrats will have is turning them out on election day. But if you look at the the, the data and the, the what polling that's coming out now, most of those new voters are saying that they're they're voting Democrat. But as I said, the, the challenge is going to get, yeah. get them to the polls. And, and Matthew, that, that's the challenge every cycle for Democrats. They, they, they register a lot of folks, and just getting them to show up is a completely different story. Yeah, well, I also think, you know, if we're talking about a 10-point advantage of the new voters in terms of leaning Democrat, that's, you know, 10% of, uh, of a million is 100,000. Governor Abbott won his last re-election bid by a million votes. So that's still only a pretty small dent in there. And that's assuming every single one of those new voters shows up to vote, which, you know, like you said, is, is pretty unlikely. Yeah, indeed, if they all show up to vote, too. Guys, thank you so much. Matthew, we appreciate it. Bud, thanks for joining us, and, and good work on that scoop with Betsy Price. Bernadine, we will see you next Sunday as well. Thank you for watching, as always. We will see you next Sunday and take you inside Texas politics. Until then, hope you have a great week.